They get thrown into the fire, but these are the people that stand up for God. Why is it that God doesn't seem to show up for us when we stand for him at times? Is there anybody in this room that has taken a stand to do something right and you still end up in the thing that you thought you were trying to avoid and you prayed to God to deliver you, but they held on to their convictions? Listen to me. It's very easy for us to make excuses when we want to escape. But these guys didn't try to escape. They just decided that the pressure to bow and the threat to burn and the order to bind them was not more powerful than their bond to God. Because God knows that there are bonds that are strengthened by fire, not broken by it. Closing out our series today called Group Chats, and I wonder, is there anybody here that loves a good boy band? Thank you very much for the seven of us that really actually enjoy boy bands. For some reason, boy bands are a phenomenon. There's a lot of them that are familiar to us, the Beatles and in fact, the term boy band became popular because of New Edition. How many of y'all know that New Edition was actually the ones that popularized the term? But of course, we had the Jackson 5. My goodness, I, I love the Jackson 5. That is not the Jackson 5 right there. <laughs> but, but I do want to say that there's so many different bands that you might have heard of and love, like the Jonas Brothers or New Kids on the Block or... Backstreet Boys, I can tell you, there's even a new phenomenon, BTS. My daughters love BTS. See, they're over there. Look at them. They're just, ooh, that boy's good. They good. They're over there just clapping. But as it goes with the cultural phenomenon with boy bands, it seems like they all end up moving in one direction. They, they all end up getting to the end of the road. And eventually they say, bye, bye, bye. Thank you, everybody. I worked on that joke this week. Thank you for those of you that got it. But many of these bands had to deal with insurmountable challenges to stay together, challenges on the outside of them, challenges on their team. And many of them, their interests changed and they sought out personal, you know, desires or a solo career. The shelf life of a band is very short. And we all want to be a part of a group, don't we? People we identify with, people that we feel a strong connection with, that offer us friendship. We want to be in those types of groups. Well, guess what? Not all boy bands break up. And not all bands in general break up. In fact, in the Old Testament book, we're going to learn about a friendship between four guys, a guy named Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These guys are not a band, but they are some guys that share the same sensibilities, came from the same city. And now when we read about them in the text, they are in their captivity. They've been taken away from everything that they love and they've been taken away from their homeland. And perhaps over the years of spending time together, they knew each other's quirks and they had this wonderful friendship and they accelerated and they went to a different level in a very, very hostile culture, hostile to their faith. But they were promoted because they had great conviction and they were excellent at everything that they did. And they decided that they were going to keep their convictions, even though they were in a context that was not familiar for them. And Daniel, who's the author of this text, is going to take us to a very important time in their lives. Now, Daniel's writing about this story. He apparently isn't a part of it, but he hasn't launched a solo career. He's talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, the leader of the time, who had built a gold statue 90 feet high, 9 feet thick, and he set it up and then ordered all of the important leaders, everybody around, to worship this idol. It's a dedication ceremony. The scriptures are going to come up on the screen, but let me paraphrase what happened to you for you. He, he tells everybody, every race, every color, and every creed, listen up. The music's coming. The band's coming out. Drum cymbals. Everything is going to be out. And anyone who does not kneel and worship shall be thrown immediately into a blazing, roaring furnace. This is intense. So as soon as the band started playing, they were ordered to kneel down and to worship this idol that he set up. Now, this dominant culture was very strong about its beliefs. And this is very fascinating. Notice the call to worship is actually couched and attached in a threat. This is important. Anyone who doesn't worship will be thrown into a roaring furnace. Imagine if this was the worship strategy of our church today. It's like, hey, everybody, when the music starts, you better worship. It's praise or blaze. How about that? 
We got a furnace after church for you if you don't worship Jesus. Huh? Would, you, would you like that church? Great strategy to grow a church, said no one ever. It's not dissimilar from our times, though. Our culture says, if you don't bow to this, we'll make sure you burn. We'll burn your influence. We'll burn your authority. If you don't bow to a certain thing, it becomes a cruel song and a cruel dance. And all the culture cares about is public participation and not privately held convictions. And so the story accelerates and we find out that some of the astrologers went to the king and informed on the Jews because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they weren't having it. These are still Jewish boys in a Babylonian culture, and they don't pay attention to just serving some heathen king. Uh, they, they, they serve God, and they're still immersed in their belief. And here in the text, these astrologers are upset because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had rose to prominence in that culture. And they're upset because the power has been overturned. So they tell King Nebuchadnezzar, long live the king. You issued a decree requiring all the people to bow down and to worship the gold statue. And they go on and they say this decree also states that those who refuse to obey must be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there's some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue that you have set up. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he flew into a rage, man. He got upset. You ever watch those old commercials of the dude that, uh, that would sit in the couch and the speaker would come on and his face would start flopping? I think that's what happened here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were brought in and he says to him, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the gold statue I have set up. Listen to me, everybody. This is important. Nebuchadnezzar knew the correlation between what we serve and who we worship. He knew that there was a dynamic there. And so he put pressure to bow because what you worship, you will eventually become. It's why we have a worship set before we even get into the word, because we start to worship our God and we try to get our character formed to the character and the goodness of God in returning our words to him in worship. So here in this text, Nebuchadnezzar knows something that is powerful. He says, I'll give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I've made. And when you hear the sound of the instruments, when you hear the sound of the music, you better bow down. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blood blazing furnace. And then here's the question that's still being asked today. What God will be able to rescue you from my power? What I always find interesting about our culture is they don't make obedience optional. And yet for many of us that follow Jesus, our, our whole desire at times is just to go with what feels right for the moment. Here's the equation. It's simple math, bow or burn. No bargaining, no compromise, no let's meet in the middle. And I know I enjoy all different forms of music. You'll hear me quoting everybody from the Wu-Tang Clan to Prince to, well, I don't know, Mercy Me. Shout out to our pastor Jim over there who still loves Mercy Me. Pray for him, Okay. But, but what you worship, you will eventually become. And in this text, the original language says that when that music played, everybody bowed down instantly. Isn't it so interesting how so many times we can shut our brains off and not go to our convictions and realize that deeply held convictions sometimes are the things that actually push back a culture just impeding on us. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We don't need to defend ourselves before you. If we're thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. They have a unified response. And it's fascinating because they knew that they weren't gonna bow to an idol because of their long-held convictions. The pressure to bow is always attached with the threat to burn. Think about this, everybody. Nobody cared what they would do in private. They only cared about what they would do in public. And I don't know about you, I might feel tempted to just bow down and just sing some hill song or sing some Bethel music while I'm bowing down worshiping an idol. Nobody would know, right? 
But they have convictions. They say they will not bend their knees. Nebuchadnezzar was so furious with these guys that his face became distorted with rage. And he commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. He turns up the pressure. Have you ever noticed when you push back on something with your own conviction that that's when things get even hotter sometimes? That's when the argument or the challenge or the tension gets even worse. This is what happens in the context. There's a pressure to bow. And then there is a threat that you are going to burn. And then that leads to an order to be bound. He ordered the strongest men of his army to bind these guys and throw them into the blazing furnace. Maybe someone in your organization, for those of us that are not sure, or if we're followers of Jesus, yet yeah, we don't know where we land spiritually. This is for you as well. Think about the times in your organization when top management asks some employees to do something that you don't think is best for the direction of your team. And they attach it to a policy that says you have to comply or it jeopardizes some of your benefits or it jeopardizes some of your influence. It's the same thing that's happening here. So they tie them up, watch this, and threw them into the furnace, fully dressed in their pants, turbans, robes, and other garments. So the big question for all of us, regardless of where you land spiritually, is where is God in this? Why do the people that say, y'all going to help me preach today? I know this is a new church. Y'all are looking at me. Y'all getting me scurred and insecure. So, so, so y'all going to have to loosen up because I'm loose. I'm ready to preach. Y'all ready? Okay. The new church. So we're going to have to learn how to be with each other. All right. So, so listen, everybody. Here's what happens in the text here. They get thrown into the fire, but these are the people that stand up for God. Why is it that God doesn't seem to show up for us when we stand for him at times? Is there anybody in this room that has taken a stand to do something right and you still end up in the thing that you thought you were trying to avoid and you prayed to God to deliver you, but they held on to their convictions? Listen to me. It's very easy for us to make excuses when we want to escape, but these guys didn't try to escape. They just decided that the pressure to bow and the threat to burn and the order to bind them was not more powerful than their bond to God. Because God knows that there are bonds that are strengthened by fire, not broken by it. God knows there's certain fires that you have to go through that you won't be broken by, you'll be built up by it. And he's built it so that our faith will flourish. And the way our faith flourishes is we need friends And we need a furnace. So here's three things. At our church, we say that note takers are history makers. Here's three things that you need to know that's going to grow your faith spiritually. Number one, your faith needs a foundation. We sang about it just a little while ago. You need a foundation. Number two, you need friends. Believe it or not, the extroverts are like, yes, more introverts are like, no, okay? (laughs) But three, you also need a furnace. See, faith needs a foundation. Internal principles that allow you to exist when you're experiencing external pressure. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, we don't need to defend ourselves before you. Is there anybody like me that struggles? I always want to defend myself. I'm going to talk up. I'm going to clap back. I'm going to, I'm going to say something. They said, hey, we don't need to defend ourselves because if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us. He'll rescue us from your power, and even if he doesn't, we're still not bound. We want to make it clear to you, we'll never serve your gods. They had a bond to God first, then they had a bond to each other, and they believed that God was able to deliver them. You see, conviction is facing a circumstance where you can't determine any good possible outcome, but you still stand with your conviction. And it's very hard to do in a culture of indifference. But I want to tell you something. If you're going to truly serve God well, and you're going to surrender your life to him, this is how you have to pray. Too many of us live our lives with what if statements. What if I don't get the job? What if I don't get married? What if I don't get pregnant? What if I told my child, if I'm told by my doctor that my child is going to have Down syndrome? What if my parents get Alzheimer's? What if I don't find somebody to love me? Most of our lives are lived with what ifs. You know what the powerful principle here is in this text? They didn't live by what ifs, they lived by even ifs. Even if I don't get the job, I'm still going to serve God. Even if I get rejected, I'm still going to tell the truth. 
Even if I'm still single for a long time, I'm still going to be positive. Even if our efforts to build a family are daunting, I am going to praise God. Even if my singleness is prolonged, I am going, we have to stop living our lives on what if statements and start building them on even if statements. So how is this bolstered? It's bolstered with friends. You need friends moving in the same spiritual trajectory. And if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I hope that you're leaning into a friend with a person that is not a Christian. And if you're a Christian, you need balances with friends that don't have faith. But that should be a, a, a balanced situation, not a disproportionate situation. See, faith always needs a connection. Sin didn't come into the world until two people were there. Because the enemy is always attacking relationships. Our relationship with God is tightly linked to others. Just like hunger is an indication that we need food and thirst is an indication that we need water. Just like exhaustion is a built-in signal that says you need some rest. I can tell you that we have a built-in thing that needs friendship. Think about this. You'll never see in scripture the names Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by themselves. It's almost like a first name, middle name, and last name. They became so tight that they're referred to as one group of people. Listen, you need friends that are going to root your faith and not rupture your faith. And too many of us get around people that break our faith down. You need friends that are going to see the flames with you approaching, and they're going to stick with you. They're like, yo, I got you. We're going into this. I'm going with you. <laughs> you need some friends that will feel the flames with you as well, that they'll stick in it with you. But you also need some friends that won't flee when you're facing your furnace. And that's what we hope this church can be for you. The king got so upset that he turned up the heat. And sometimes if things don't get hot in our lives, God knows that we'll never get holy. And the word holy doesn't mean perfection. It just means becoming more like God, so sometimes things got to get turned up in your marriage. Sometimes things got to get turned up at your job because if things didn't get hot, we'd get complacent. If, if things didn't get hot, we'd lose our convictions. And so the king in his anger demanded that the hot fire in the furnace, that the flames would, would get hotter. And the flames actually killed the soldiers as they threw the men in it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego securely tied with thrown into the flames. But watch this. Suddenly, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? And they said, yes, we did. And he said, look, I see four men unbound, walking around in the fire, unharmed, and the fourth one looks like God. God got in the midst of people that were willing to hold to their convictions, just like God will get in the midst just for you. Listen, the four men became free in the fire. What if the thing that you need right now is to stop being afraid of being immersed in the fire and realizing your freedom might be coming by what you're immersed in, that difficult circumstance, that big challenge that you're facing? Right now, God is able to help you feel free in your fire. Look, Nebuchadnezzar came as close as he could to the door and he shouted out to them, servants of the most high God, come on out, come here. So they stepped out of the fire and the high officials, governors and advisors crowded. Not a hair on their heads was singed. Their clothing was not scorched and they didn't even smell like smoke. You know what that's called? It's called a miracle. It's called God's intervention. And it's also called something that's available to you as well. This whole thing prefigures Christ. Here's the gospel. Here's the good news packed into this. Jesus got into the fire for the judgment that was due to all of us. And because he got in the fire with us, the fires of judgment, we all can walk out unharmed because of his goodness. That's why we worship God at the beginning of this service, because we are so thankful. So the question is, if Jesus can get in those fires for us to get our salvation, do you think the fire you're in right now is going to destroy you? That, that fire is meant to refine you. And wouldn't it be incredible if our level of trust grew today because of this story? Charles Spurgeon, the great preacher from many, many years ago, said that there's a furnace that men prepare. There's a furnace that Satan prepares. But there's also a furnace that God prepares. The difference is the fire in the first two can destroy you. But the fire in the last one is not fatal. 
God will refine you as a result of it. Nebuchadnezzar eventually came to these guys and he said, hey, they, these guys defied my command and were willing to die rather than serve or worship any other God except their own God. Therefore, I make this decree. If any people, whatever their race or nation or language, speak a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, then they'll be torn limb from limb. Aren't you glad you live in this culture and not that one? My goodness, this is intense. He says there's no other God that can rescue like this. Maybe you're afraid to face your furnace. Your furnace is waiting for you at your job tomorrow morning. Maybe it's waiting when you go home in your marriage, in your relationship, a connection to your kids. But God knows that there are some bonds that are strengthened by fire, not broken by it. So the question I want to ask you today is, what if the fire that you're in right now or that you're about to face didn't break you off from your buddies or your beliefs? Because most of the times when we face fires in our life, the first thing that we want to do is move away from our friends and give up on our beliefs. And some fires are intended for you to get closer to your friends and to build your belief. I believe that many of us in this room are up for a promotion, maybe in your job, maybe in your relationships, but not without some heat first. That... The heat is getting turned on in your life for a reason. Now think about this, everybody. These Christians were thrown to the fire because of what they were willing not to worship. And that's going to be the challenge for all of us today. Listen, the fire inside of you always has to be greater than the fire outside of you. That's why I'm trying to get us to be passionate for living for God. Because when you have fire inside of you, fire that comes around you will not destroy you you'll just be more refined because there are some bonds that are strengthened by fire, not broken by it. And for your faith to flourish and for my faith to flourish, you need friends. And guess what? You also need some challenges that fire.